All right, greetings, folks. Uh, Van and Vivian here as we continue on with, uh, with our study in Romans. Um, we are now, we have moved uh, from chapter 11, which was extremely challenging. We've moved from chapter 11 into chapter 12. Now, in chapter 11, in, in chapter 11, we uh, came across these words of Paul in, in verse 13, where he says, I speak to you Gentiles. Uh, so th that's our audience, even as we move into chapter 12, the audience is still Gentiles. You know, at the beginning of Romans, the audience was very heavily focused towards the Jew. So it was the Jew first and the Gentiles uh, subsequently. So now we're going to see Paul. Paul's going to continue to say a lot of things to the Gentiles. And a lot of this is going to have to do with Gentile behavior. Now, a lot of this is predicated on the fact that the, 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 the Gentiles of Israel, and that's a phrase that we use that is, that is probably unique to us, uh, and, 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 and by that we mean there were, there were Hebrews of Israel that were not circumcised. And, and you say, well, that's ridiculous. Whoever heard of a Hebrew that's not circumcised? Well, it is biblical. It happened plenty of times in scripture that, that the Hebrews, um, especially those that were not being religious, uh, just didn't bother with circumcision. An example is Timothy. Timothy is an example of it. And uh, so is uh, Titus. And Trophimus. And Trophimus. I mean, they, these were Hebrews. Hebrew men that were not circumcised. And so we know then of Israel, of those Hebrews, the religious ones, the Jews were circumcised, and the non-religious Hebrews, uh, the Jews referred to them as Gentiles. And we know that from John 7:35. Uh, but, you know, but I, you know, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be prescriptive here. Uh, it's best that you that we all. Uh, prove this for ourselves by spending a lot of time with scripture and and these words will come out they're just not reinforced by any teachers now in, in chapter 12 we've subtitled this we being many are one body in christ so i will see that as we get to verse five um so we'll we'll start the reading and uh, moving into, into chapter 12 with the audience being now very, continues to be very focused on Gentiles. Romans 12, beginning at verse one. I beseech you, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so let's let's look in the, into the details. Uh, moving into chapter 12, verse 1, looking at the first part of it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So, you know, we've all heard things about this verse in the past. And, uh, and yet still kind of like wonder, well, what's a living sacrifice all about? Uh, Paul starts off with these words, I beseech you, therefore. Now, the therefore, as even Liz has observed and commented, the therefore points back to uh, things that had been previously uh, stated by Paul. So the, the therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, is in response to Paul's praise Gloria, and, and that's, that, that's what we're calling it, those words of chapter 11, verse 33 through 36, where Paul praises the, uh, the glory of God's wisdom, his knowledge, his judgment, his ways, where Paul was just absolutely gobsmacked to come to the understanding that God had made both uh, the Jews and the Gentiles sinners that he might save them all. 
Um, so that's that's the, 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 the therefore then is in response to that thought, that prior thought. And he calls them brethren by the mercies of God. Now, without the mercies of God, the brethren would not have been called to be a living sacrifice. So we say, well, how can you make that assertion? And, and I should insert here, I, I don't want to be prescriptive. Uh, we're not interested in having you understand something simply because we assert it. What I assert is of no consequence. Uh, what we're looking at are the words of scripture. So the authority is the scripture. So but you, can, you may depreciate fully my assertions and put in favor what is actually being read. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that. So now this, this matter of being a living sacrifice by the mercies of God, what, we, what we've learned is that all the Gentiles of Israel, and we've just described the Gentiles of Israel as being those Hebrews that were not circumcised. So all those Gentiles of Israel, the uncircumcised Hebrews, and there was a large population of them, were breakers of God's covenant. That's Genesis 17, 14. That's the covenant, that's the, that's the instruction to Abraham that every man-child of the, of the Hebrews, and, and, and Abraham was a Hebrew. He was never called a Jew. He was called a Hebrew. Every Hebrew needed to be circumcised. Now, without circumcision, they were breakers of God's covenant. And then, as a result of that, they would need, they would be in need of mercy, because they've, they've broken the law, or the, the covenant. I, I'm incorrect to say law. It was law. in the law as well. It was in the law, yeah, but at that point, yeah. it, was a, it was a covenant. Yeah. Okay, now, move forward here. I'm going to ask the question. So we're looking at the mercies of God. And the question is, does the unsaved Gentile of the nations, that would be me, uh, or one that is a partaker of the benefit, that would also be me, partaker of the benefit, 1 Timothy 6, 2. And I call myself a partaker of the benefit because that's what Paul called me. So I'm not a saint. Paul spoke to saints. He spoke to the called to be saints. He actually called them. That's why they ended up being saints. He called them. I wasn't called by Paul, but Paul called me a partaker of the benefit. Now, does an unsaved Gentile of nations, of which I'm representative, Vivian's representative, I think most of us all are Gentiles of the nations, do we need the mercies of God? Do we, do we need the mercies of God? Do, we, do I need the mercies of God? Anybody think they need the mercies of God? To get saved. What? You've, for, got, the, yeah. you've got, does yeah. the unsaved. Yeah. yeah. Does the unsaved, do the unsaved need mercies of Gentiles of the nations? So, it's thrown around. We talk about mercy. We talk about grace. But do I specifically need mercy? No, I'll say no. Uh, no, I don't need God's mercies. And, and, and I don't mean, I, I'm not trying to be cute by saying that. We say no, because Gentiles of the nations are not under the law. Right? So, and I know that. You know that for yourself. We're not under the law. So since I'm not under the law, I'm not a law breaker. Now, but yet I know I'm a sinner. Now, how do I know that I'm a sinner? Well, I, I'm familiar with the law. And actually, it's actually something that's in my mind. So my conscience knows when I transgress, when I do something wrong, my conscience, I don't have to go to the, the Decalogue, I don't have to go to Leviticus, I don't, I don't have to go to some place to find out what laws I'm breaking. I know that when I break a law, I actually, even though I'm not under the law, 
So the thoughts of the unsaved accuse or else excuse them. So as, as a Gentile living day by day, uh, when I when I do something, I go through this thought process, and maybe you do as well. I think, well, can I do this? Can I get away with it? So I, I and then I it, it will either excuse me to do it. I'll say I'll minimize it, and I'll say, well, it's not that big a thing. I can do it. Uh, otherwise, my conscience will accuse me. So my conscience is at play, but um, that's how I know I'm a sinner. Now, the unsaved Gentile, the nations, uh, the judgment is yet future. Now, because it's yet future, so I'm not judged. The, the, the uh, Hebrew was judged at the point they broke the law or a covenant. They knew they had transgressed something that God had said to them. Now, my judgment if I, or the judgment of the unsaved is yet future. Consequently, uh, this allows time for salvation by grace alone through faith alone. So therefore, I conclude um, that I don't need mercy because I have yet to come to judgment, to have my, my transgressions uh, put before. Uh, and and judged. So consequently, I can be saved by grace alone through faith or by believing alone, just those things. And this is which is what Paul says, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So then how does judgment for those that are without the law? So the Gentiles of the nations are without the law. How do the how does that compare to those in the law? So we'll, we'll look at uh, those that are without law and those that are with law. Now, without law, the conscience is the record book. So my, my conscience is actually recording everything that I've done from a youth. I don't, I've, you may find that you can do this. I've, I, know, I was noticing that I can remember just about every bad thing that I've done since childhood. And I'll tell you, there's a basket full of bad things that I've done. Some things that I've done actually make me uh, just cringe. Uh, I think about my youth and some of the things that I did. So my conscience, my memory, I, I, those things are all recorded. Now, in the law, so those are, that's for those that are without the law. My conscience is the record book. But those that are in the law, there's a little bit of a difference here. It's the flesh that is the record book. And we're going to elaborate on that. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, and, and we've covered this before, so we're taking a look back here where we, where we read, for as many as have sinned without law, that would be me, uh, shall also perish without law. That's for the unsaved. And as many, so notice it's not all, but as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now, we move on to verse 13. We're, we are going to elaborate on these things. So we read here, go ahead, Vivian. Romans 2.13, and it opens with a bracket. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Okay, so now this verse, when we read it, for the hearers of the Lord are, law are not just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now. <clears throat> I point out the word justified is different than the word righteous. And so this sentence, this phrase here, so there's a comma, and we have the phrase, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Uh, that's not righteous. Uh, the word justified, if we put it into the context of saying, if I do something, somebody could say, well, what's your justification for doing that? 
Uh, and then just to be justified is to provide evidence. So the doers of the law, their evidence of them being righteous comes from their deeds of the law. The doers of the law shall be justified. That is their evidence for whether or not they are righteous is going to come from the law. Uh, so, and so we know that then for ourselves. If somebody uh, has to go to court, they have to give justification to prove their innocence. They have to explain things. So this, this phrase is not saying that one is, is righteous. It just says that's where your evidence for your righteousness is going to be sourced. Now, we continue on. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, the Gentiles, which have not the law, and that would be Gentiles of Israel, as well as Gentiles of the nations, the Gentiles, which have not the law, and then notice this, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Now notice this, their conscience also bearing witness. So I said, my, my conscience is the record book. Here it is. Their conscience also bearing witness. And their thoughts, the mean while accusing or ex else excusing. So this, this phrase here, uh, and their thoughts, the mean, mean, the word mean here actually points to arbitration. So the thoughts are the arbitrator between accusing or excusing the, these deeds that we do. So you may have experienced this where you think, well, this is okay for me to do. What am I doing? I'm rationalizing. So my thought, I have this thought process that goes on and I rationalize things. So my conscience is the record, but it bears the record. And what I thought about doing what I did is the, is the uh, trail of evidence on whether I accused or excused myself doing it. So there's, there's the record book. Now, and then it goes on to say, in the day, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my, that would be Paul's gospel. So my comment here is, in the law, the works they do show faith. So that's, that's the record of, it should be to show faith. Uh, James, we know that from James chapter 2, verse 18, I will show thee my faith by my works. So when, when people do works, uh, say those that are under the law, they're not doing works to be made righteous. They, they are to do works to show that they are righteous. Today, it's become topsy-turvy. We, we think that it's commonly thought that I need to be a good person, do good, in order to be considered a righteous person, like my good deeds stack up higher than my bad deeds. But biblically, the, the place of doing things, doing, doing right, doing well, is to show that there is faith, that I believe God. Now, this is for the Hebrew. Now, notice what the point that Paul is making is that the, the, the uh, Gentiles actually have this law written in their hearts. So it's, it's Gentiles of the Hebrews. The Gentiles of the Hebrews, and that's really Paul's main focus. We're on the same bus but he's focusing on the Hebrews, the uncircumcised, that they have the law written in the heart, in their hearts. We too are very conscious of right and wrong. 
And that's what convicts us. So we have this sense of, have I done right or have I done wrong? So now it says, in the day. So I, I have this record book of what I've done, and there'll be a day of judgment. And th that in that day of judgment, the individual's conscience will bear witness against those that did not believe God unto salvation. So it's, it's not as if, you know, might they be able to lie to God about whether or not they believe? No, the conscience has the truth, and that's what's going to be made evident. Now, I note that the word mercy and its various forms like mercy or merciful or, or merciless or whatever, that word mercy in its various forms occurs 360 times in the King James Bible. But notice this, that the word mercy is not mentioned at the judgment Paul references. It doesn't speak of mercy. And never once is mercy mentioned in the rev revelation. Isn't that interesting? So God's salvation by grace during the present dispensation, that is Paul's gospel, averts this judgment, this judgment where there is no mercy for all who receive it now, during this dispensation. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a closer look at, the, at dispensational grace and mercy. And so we've noted now that mercy is not mentioned in the Revelation. And from Revelation 1-1 to the end of chapter 22, there is no mention of mercy. There is a mention of grace, we'll get to it, but there is no mention of mercy. Okay, okay so Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17. Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said... And so what did they say? Let's take a look at what they said. They said, God have mercy on us. No, actually, that's not what they're going to say. They're not going to say, God have mercy on us. They're going to say this. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? So this, this crowd, they know, they know about the Lamb. They know about the Lamb, and they know about the wrath of the Lamb. And they say, fall, they say to the rocks and mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face, the throne. They say, from him that sitteth on the throne, the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And then we see in verse chapter of uh, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so that, there's the great white throne judgment. And the judgment is done. And those uh, who are seeking to be justified by what they have done, when their names are not lit written, are not found, in the Lamb's Book of Life, they, are, they end up being cast into the lake of fire, no mention of mercy. Now, let's look at dispensational grace and mercy. We're going to look at uh, grace and mercy. Uh, we'll look at it in Gen from Genesis to the Gospel accounts. We're going to look at it as stated in the Pauline epistles, and we'll look at grace and mercy from Hebrews to the Revelation. Now, first, the Genesis to Gospel accounts of grace and mercy. Grace and mercy is entirely God's discretion. Those who get grace, those who get mercy, are at God's discretion. How do I know that? I can read it. Uh, Exodus 33, verse 19, a second part. 
I will pro proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And then Luke 18 verse 38. And he, that is Bartimaeus, and he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That interesting, Bartimaeus had to petition Jesus, and whom he recognized as the son of David. He was petitioning Bartimaeus to have mercy on him. In other words, it was not freely available. He had to make a request. And then Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Okay, now here we have, we've gone now from mercy to grace. And notice this, that in this period from Genesis through to the gospel accounts, grace is spoken of as being found. It's, it is, it's found grace. For instance, Noah found grace. Uh, Ruth found grace. You'll find this, these words, found grace in scripture in this period of, 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 uh, of accounts from Genesis to right through, through the gospel accounts. All right, let's move forward into the Pauline epistles. We talk about grace and mercy. Now, mercy to all the called saints, that would be covenant breakers, and grace to all men. Now we see Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All right, so now the words are different. It's no longer found grace. It's now the grace of God hath appeared so it's it's now appeared to not just some men but to all men so all men of the earth grace the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared that wasn't pro the true prior to paul saying this and then titus chapter 3 verse 5 not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Okay, so now mercy is also in full action here for those covenant breakers, where Paul speaking to Titus, which is one of those that are called to be a saint. He was a called to be saint. He was uncircumcised. He needed mercy. <clears throat> so Titus receives mercy first because he was guilty of something. He was guilty of being not circumcised. So he needs to receive mercy, and then he can be saved. By grace. By grace. So the called, the called, those that Paul called, received mercy, and then saved by grace through faith. So we see Romans 30, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 3, verse 30, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in action here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Romans 3, 30b is that the, circum the uncircumcision are Safe. justified through, uh, through faith, faith. Through faith. Through faith. So I'm saved, <clears throat> I'm saved not by my faith, I'm saved through faith, and that actually, that is the faith of Jesus. So I'm not saved by my faith, I am saved through the faith of Jesus himself. Uh, we've, we have learned uh, in our study of uh, Ephesians that, uh, that, Jesus is actually uh, the, um, the trustee. He is the one that is, that is the trustee, the holder of my salvation. It is through uh, him. His work. His work and his faith. Jesus hey, himself has faith. Hey, and, uh, yeah. Uh, just quick. Just yes, mention, Lord. Uh, the faith of Christ is mentioned seven times and only in the King James Bible. 
Yes. Ah, yes. excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Lori. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, it, I don't have to hold on by my faith. You know, my faith has its ups and downs. Jesus' faith is uh, uh, is not failing. So I, I am secure because of Him. All right. Now, now we're going to take a look at uh, grace and mercy from Hebrews to the revelation, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now it's going to revert to God's discretion. And this is interesting. We, we, we read the last words of Paul's letter to Philemon. We turn the page, we go to Hebrews, and now we're going to see, uh, a, change. Uh, we're gonna see a huge change. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that amazing? We turn the page. We go from Philemon, the last of Paul's epistles, to Hebrews, and the language talk about a change that let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and look at this, that we may find grace, uh, that harkens to being, you know, the found, that Noah found grace. This is now they're looking, now they're looking for mercy, and they're looking to find grace to help in the time of need. These Hebrews are going through the time of testing, and they need the mercy of God. They need grace because they're in need. Now, look at Jude. Jude chapter 1. Well, there's only one chapter. Yeah. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Uh, interesting. Now, Jude, speaking to Hebrews, he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. They're lawbreakers. They need to ask for mercy so that they can be saved. And then finally, we will include that which is said in the Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, John's words here, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. What is that? That's a petition. John is petitioning the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The ones to whom he's writing He's writing to those Hebrews that are going through that time of testing. So he makes a petition here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay. Now, we're going to look at a couple of examples. An example of pleading for mercy. Matthew chapter 8, verses 22, sorry, 28 through to 32. And when he was come to the other side of the into the country of the Gersonians, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Now, notice this, before the time, I say, aha. Those devils knew, they knew that there's a time coming. Art thou come to hither to torment us? So they know that torment is coming for them, and they know that there's going to be a time. They knew, those devils knew. And continuing on in this chapter, and there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, Suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. Now, isn't this interesting? These words, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. What is that? That's a petition for mercy. Suffer us to go. See, see, he, they, they're trying to avert the torment before the time. So they make a petition. Their petition is, suffer us to go away. And, and Jesus granted mercy to them, and they, they went. 
They went into this into the uh, the herd of swine, and we know how the story ends. The the herd then ran into mm -hmm. the water. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to look one more example of uh, pleading for mercy. Matthew chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. And behold, two blind men sitting by the, the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebu rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should, shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Hey, sir. So here's the petition of two blind men, have mercy on us. And then I, I find it interesting, isn't it interesting? Jesus, God, who knows everything, what does he do? He asks a question. You say, well, why would Jesus, who knows everything, ask a question? Well, it needs to be recorded. So the, the, the petition for what they want, Jesus gets them to say the words, what will ye that I should do unto you? And he, he they tell them they want their eyes opened. And so immediately their eyes. So what happened? They received their petition of mercy and their eyes were open. So these are these are examples of pleading for mercy. Uh, I today, uh, all all Gentiles, in fact, all men today all over the earth uh, are not in a position where we need to ask for mercy because we are not yet judged. We're at a point today where the grace of God has appeared to all men. All we need to do is simply believe that salvation is in God, believe that, and one is saved. And not only saved, but sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption and becomes a purchased possession. So I cannot be lost. All right, we're going to move on now to... Uh, <laughs> well, we've covered the first half of verse one. So now we'll move on. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So Paul speaking to the Gentiles of Israel, and he's addressed them in Romans chapter one, verse seven. These are the called to be saints. You'll find those words, chapter one, verse seven, the call to be saints that they are to be a living sacrifice that is expected in this life. They are expected in this life also to suffer for his sake. So Philippians 1.29. So what is a living sacrifice? It is one that is suffering in their role for service. They have to do things. They've been called by Paul, and they have answered the call of Paul, and they now are to serve, and that service that they're going to do, which is unique to them, is going to involve suffering. And then we see here, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So reasonable service and with good will doing service. So that's Ephesians 6, 7. The call to be saints were to do reasonable service. They were to do service. They were, with, they were to do good. And they were to expect to suffer for his sake. So this is why it doesn't make any sense to me when I read the words that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, because uh, this is not my experience. It was their experience, and they were informed of Paul that this was what they were to expect. They were to expect to suffer. Paul suffered. They all suffered. They had very challenging lives. Paul says, now we're looking, we're in chapter 12, verse 2, the first part, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
So I know there's a colon here. So the colon tells me that B not conformed is the, I'm sorry, is the BE transformed. So the explanation to be not conformed is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So let's look at this, the renewing of your mind. So how is that, how's that accomplished? So Paul writes of two avenues to the renewing of your mind. So this is not my opinion. i give you exactly what Paul says as to how the mind is to be renewed. Now, this was instruction to those called, but it's wisdom for me as well. So we, I take from this and I benefit from this. We can all benefit from this. Now, I will just caution that these two avenues to the renewing of your mind are very difficult to do with any kind of consistency. And you'll see that as we move into it. So these, this is instruction to the call to be saints. It's wisdom to me. Now, the first avenue, the first avenue, and what Paul is going to say here, first I'll just I'll sort of up, I'll just pique your attention. The first avenue is that the inward man that the inward man is to dwell on that which is eternal. This is the first avenue to renewing your mind. Dwell on that which is eternal. Here are the words. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. Verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Absolutely amazing. Look at this, Paul. Now, we, we talked about that they were going to suffer. And so here, here look, here are the, these. For, we cause, for which cause we faint not. They, they were under such burden, there were times where they could feel like they were fainting. And Paul, Paul's encouraging them now. He says, though, you, though our outward man perish, this is the suffering that they were going to, going through, working to get the gospel of grace to us. They were going through this. He, he, Paul says, yet the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. How is the inward man renewed day by day? Paul says, don't look at the things which are seen. Paul says, but look at the things which are not seen. Paul says, for the things which are seen are temporal. They're passing away. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So avenue one to the renewing of the mind is dwell on those things which are eternal. So I know that my citizenship is in the heavenly places. I'm going to dwell there with you all forever. Now, the renewing of your mind, here's the second avenue. The second avenue is to be kind and forgiving to one another. No, really? Yep. This is second avenue to read the renewing of your mind. Vivian. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24 and verse 32. 22 through 24, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is absolutely amazing. Paul says, put off the old man. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Here it is, renewing of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. Every one of us as believers has a new man and we can put him on. And we can tell when that new man has been put on because, look at the instructions, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath 
forgiven you. Whenever we see a believer uh, digging at another believer for some doctrinal differences, when they're sort of being nasty, and we've seen plenty of that, see plenty of it in, on, on the internet, where believers are just pawing at each other with criticism and harsh words. So, I mean, some of the things that we've seen and heard are just heartrending, where Christians, or I should say believers, tear away at each other over this silly little stuff of doctrinal differences. Paul says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So there's my second avenue to being renewed in my mind, is to be kind and forgiving to one another. That's why I don't want to ever be critical of somebody else's doctrines. We've all been through plenty of strange doctrines. We're all trying to learn. We're all struggling to learn things. And if somebody gets caught up in some bad doctrine, remember that they're that same person who's a believer has been purchased by God through Jesus Christ. And we, I should be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving and understanding, edify, comfort, build up, encourage. All right, the two avenues. Let's move on. We're going to look now at verses. Actually, we're going to look now at chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. So Vivian has a passage here to read. I think it's 3 through 8. 3 through 8, yes. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that hath teaching, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on ex exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, so we'll go back now to uh, verse three, where Paul says, "For I say through the through the grace given unto me, Paul received grace to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think." Pay very careful attention to those words. Then there's a semicolon, which says now there's a connected thought. The connected thought is, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man, the measure of faith. So my comment here is that the, this is instruction to the many members of the one body. It begins with how they were to think of themselves. All believers are to esteem one another, not to think of himself more highly. So the, this is an important wisdom to me. I should esteem every brother and Christ, uh, sister who is a believer in Christ, in Jesus. Esteem one another. Think of them as equals. We are equal together. But to think soberly according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So evidently, my comment here is evidently, there were differences between the brethren in their measure of faith. Now, a measure of faith, we, uh, we also understand that to be the measure of how much they believed. The measure of faith is how much, how much of God's word they actually believe. 
even so for us at the present time. There are differences between how much we believe of God's word, and we're going we're to demonstrate this. Uh, they, at that time, did not believe everything from God back then. Now, my question is, do we believe everything of God today? We, could, we like to think so, but do we? We're going to take a little survey in a minute here. And so here, Luke 17, 5, notice these words. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. So what they're asking for is, God, we believe certain things, but we want to believe more. Increase what it is that we believe. They increase our faith. And then if you're not sure about that, look at Luke 24, 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Okay, so the fools were the disciples on the, on the, uh, the Emmaus Road, the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Christ, meets up with them on their way home, and he says to them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So my point is, there are differences in the measure of faith. As much as we'd like to think we believe everything, there are differences. We don't believe everything. We're still learning. We're, we're, st <laughs> we're still learning. Okay, so the, my comment here is that a perfect man... We haven't got to the verse yet. Ephesians. Oh, 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 yes. Sorry. <laughs> if so, I'm going to go. Okay. To yeah, I have to. Now I have to go. Ahead. I. Uh, I Ephesians blinked. four, verse thirteen. Okay. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay. Now, now again, this is to the call to be st saints, and and I note here as to what is being said in Ephesians 4.13. And I'm relieved to know that Paul is addressing the call to be saints. He, my comment here is that the perfect man and the measure would be achieved when all of God's word is believed. All of God's word is to be believed. Now, believers in the body of Christ today like to think that we do indeed, we believe all that God has said, but is it so? Let's take a little survey of matters. So does the believer believe the Bible or does the believer believe biblical scholarship? Or in other words, what it is I've been told the Bible says. So do I believe the Bible or do I believe biblical scholarship? So we're going to begin our survey. Here's the first item. Number one, does the believer need to be baptized? Now, I'm not the authority here. The authority is the words. So you're going to look at the words and you can decide for yourself, not my assertion. So we'll read. First Corinthians chapter one, verses 14 through 17. I, that is Paul, I thank God that I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Okay, so there are the words, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Can I but, ask a question? Yes, please do. Is it possible that that verse is saying that it was Paul that wasn't sent, sent to be baptized, but maybe that there were other people who were doing the baptismals? Liz, that's an excellent question, because why didn't Paul send someone else to baptize and then tell us about that person that he sent to baptize? So 
Christ sent me not to baptize, but I am going to send to you somebody else. And he'll do the baptism. I'm too busy. I've got too much of a workload. No, Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So evidently, baptism is not necessary. Otherwise, Paul would have given some instruction here as to what about baptism, because he said, I'm not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And then not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be, of none, um, right. be made of none effect. So I leave it with you. This is what Paul said, not to baptize. Number one. Let's look at number two. Does the believer need to tithe? And I underscore the word need. Let's look at scripture. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six and seven, Paul speaking. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Okay, so again, the words are the authority, not what I have to say. So what Paul has written here is, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. So my comment here is giving is not of necessity. That's what the words say. Not of necessity. You can give, but it's not of necessity. Don't give grudgingly and don't give of necessity. There is, it is not, according to these words, it is not necessary to give, but you can give. I should also say back on this matter of baptism, I, I have been baptized. Vivian's been <laughs> baptized twice. <laughs> my parents were baptized. My brother was baptized. My sister's been baptized. We've all been baptized. Be being baptized is not, a, is not a sin. The question is, is it needful? Do, does one need to be baptized? Does one need to tithe? So if somebody comes up to you in the church and says, you, you know, we'd like to see you tithe. Well, this verse is the wisdom that I have that Paul says it is not necessary to give. You can give, don't give grudgingly, and it's not necessary, but you can give. Absolutely. Well, I think that that's the, the, the thing with a, a church in a building. If you're going to put yourself in that position, you know, I think you're going you're gonna to be in a position to help pay the cost to go there and worship. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, Liz. And you raise a very good point. So, Practically speaking, we go to a church, they have facilities, they have employees, the people that are employed, there are things that they purchase and need. So, you know, we know that there, that there are expenses. And so we give. As one purposeth in his heart. But give <clears throat> as you decide to give, not because you're feeling uh, uh, because of some pressure pressure doctrinally to give and it's when an obligation is put on you to give a certain amount yes yeah. right that puts us well, back I, the law. I think i think that you're going against that scripture verse though that i've heard um that says that um if if you keep tithing god will keep providing <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i know, I know. <laughs> yeah i know yeah well yeah I know. Try to out. I've heard God. other guys use that verse. Yeah. 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 No, no, we're not saying, no, I don't want to be misunderstood. We're not saying don't give. The point here is it is my decision what to give that I shouldn't be, be told how much. When I was a young boy in uh, growing up, my father, we were attending a Presbyterian church. 
and my father was vis visited by the elders of the Presbyterian Church, and they sat down with my dad, and they wanted to know they wanted to know from my dad how much money he made and how much money he was giving to the church. They actually wanted to meet with him, and they wanted to the numbers. <laughs> they wanted the, they wanted the numbers. Wow. That was the, that was that was the last day we were in the Presbyterian <laughs> church. My father was saved in a Presbyterian church in New York. And, and, and that's where I was. I came to, uh, to, to believe he was in a Presbyterian church. They're very good at getting, you know, the gospel out. My dad said, nope, that's the end of that. So we ended up going to a Baptist church. Okay. All right. So uh, that's just one more point that the, the uh, giving for as many people give, they do give because they feel if they give, you know, God's going to give back to them tenfold, yes. et cetera, et cetera. You've all heard of that. Yes. And I think, you know, I think that that falls under the, that phrase of necessity. Yeah. Like, like if I'm financially struggling. Yes. If, if I give to God, then he'll help me in that. And, and that's a, a necessity. Yes. If you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. The other it's thing really that I bad, thought really bad to get into because in my early Christian years I got into that and it really spoiled my giving. Yes. Cuz you always felt there was something behind your giving, you know? Yes. Which is what which is what teachers it, will say today. It actually spoils your faith. It sours things yeah. for yeah. the person who has faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All Neil right. had so, a question, I believe. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Neil. Ray. Ray. No, Neil had no. a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Neil. So I just wanted yeah, to well, add that the giving is, my reading is, it talks about the bounty uh, preceding the six and seven. But back then, giving could have made up a lot more than just cash. It could have been giving of um, housing, it could have been food. It could have been a clothing. Land. There's many, many things that they would have needed as yeah. uh, po apostles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we just put it in today's terms of, yeah, nobody needs that kind of stuff. You know, it just comes down to money or nothing uh, in terms of giving. Yeah. 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 You have, you, we have liberty. Yeah. You, you and I can make the decision what we're going to give, how much we're going to give. If we're even going to burden ourselves with giving, giving because you know your own situation, you know your own responsibilities and what you can do. And it's not necessarily money. Yeah, exactly. And as Niels pointed out, not necessarily money. So let's move on. I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead Just Peggy. one short question. Yes, Peggy. How do you feel about uh, a pastor being paid wages um, from the Get, uh, tithing. He How doesn't do I... hold a job in churches, but he the the people in the church he takes tithing his part out of tithing for wages yeah. to oh. to live on. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I'm of the thought. Paul says, if a man does not work, he does not deserve to eat or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. There are there are some passages where you know thou shalt not muzzle the ox. There, about the corn. <laughs> that, there are there was a pattern in Israel that and it was taken from you know their agricultural experience that as the animals worked in the field pulling the plow that they were to be allowed to take of the grain that was there as they worked. And so today, now, if a congregation, if the congregation is okay with it, they have liberty. They can decide on it. They can do it. As a rule to be imposed on you and I, eh, no. Uh, it, let, the, let the individuals of that congregation decide how they want to do things. That's where liberty comes in. Okay. Thank All right. You. We'll move on. Item number three. Does the believer need to observe communion? And, and again, 
I underscore the word knee. Now, <clears throat> I've, I've uh, as a believer, I've been in uh, many, many, many communion services. As a deacon, I've served communion. I've done, I've done all those things. So I'm asking the question, does the believer need to observe communion? So we'll look at scripture. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Okay, so Paul, Paul says here in this 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> when you come together in the church, when you come together, and, and actually to be clear on this, what was happening here was that the saints who were circumcised would gather together with the saints that were uncircumcised. So the saints, the Jews who believed, they were saints, and there were the uncircumcised who were called by Paul, they were the called to be saints. So the saints and the called to be saints came together in the church. On occasions. On occasions. They would gather together. So Paul says, when ye come together, because therefore, into one place. In other words, they had their own places. They met in homes. They met in homes. And on occasion, they would come together in one place. Paul said, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So those are the words. My, my comment is like the call to be saints. So now realizing this is a mixed audience of saints and called to be saints. The call to be saints are not instructed to eat. Those who followed Christ after the flesh that would be those Jews who believe, the Jews who believe the gospel of God, that Jesus is the Christ, they were the ones, those saints were instructed to eat. They were waiting for Jesus' second coming to the earth. Yeah, these are the ones that had, the saints were the ones that had to endure to the end. And they were gathering together with those called to be saints who were saved by the grace of God and didn't have to endure to the end. They came together. Part of them were those that were not instructed, they were instructed not to eat, and there were others that were instructed to eat. So this, this is complicated. What I take from this is, it's not necessary to observe the Lord's Supper. However, you have liberty. I, you and I have liberty. You, you and I can do what we want to do. If you are of the mind that you want to do it, you go ahead and do it. It's fine. Absolutely fine. If you are of a thought that you don't need to do it, you're fine there as well. You have absolute liberty because the call to be saints, Paul says, this is not to eat. He's First Corinthians is addressed to the call to be saints. And so he's telling them not to eat the Lord's Supper. That isn't for them. Now, oh my, we're, we've run out of time. Should we, we've got time for this one, we, haven't we? We'll, we'll, do this, we'll do this last one. Should the believer believe? the rapture or what we know as you know the catching away there are many that don't believe it many today teach the rapture does not appear in the paul's prison epistles and because it they say oh it doesn't appear in paul's prison epistles which is to the body of christ uh they teach that there is no rapture there are many if that there are right dividers there are all kinds of groups now that are saying, no, there's no rapture, there's no catching away, 
there, there's only one return, and that is the, the second return of Christ. All right, so should we should I believe in the rapture? Notice it's a, the word is should. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press for, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Okay, so we have these words here, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God. Now, I've even confirmed this in my studies by looking at the Greek. I know nothing about Greek, but I can look up a Greek lexicon and I can, I can just like a dictionary, I can find out that the high calling of God is the calling of God from up high. The calling of God from up high in Christ Jesus. So this is not a, a calling to some lofty uh, uh, assignment. No, this is a calling up high. God, this is God actually calling the believer there's going to be a, a point coming where God calls, and this is, appears now in a prison epistle. Philippians is a prison epistle. He's speaking, whatever the arguments are, he, we know for sure he is speaking to the body of Christ, and his instruction to the body of Christ is that he's pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and then he says, let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, you want to be complete, be thus minded. What Be what minded? Be minded of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So for me to be, to, the wisdom here, to be perfect in those things, be thus minded that we are pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So my comment at the end is, yes, the rapture, which we, the, the, we call it the rapture. Uh, the word rapture doesn't occur in the King James Bible, but we've, we've come because of the Latin Vulgate, we've, we've used the word rapture. Yes, the rapture is going to happen. And Paul's instruction is, be thus minded. It's about renewing the mind and looking at the eternal things. Exactly. Which we did, looked at earlier. Look at look at things which are eternal, not temporal. Okay, we're we're out of time, so we'll end it there uh, until and we'll pick up. Uh, we've actually got two more uh, questions to go through in uh, in this part of our study of ch chapter twelve. So we'll end the study 